Good morning. Hi. My name is Casey Green. I'm with the Campus Computing Project. I'd like to welcome you to what becomes a, a plenary panel for a conversation about learning 2.0 uh, here at Case. Uh, it's really a great treat for all of us to be here today and, and to be part of this conversation. This is a rare campus event in the sense of a, a campus conversation about collaborative technologies and one that collaboratively is being shared across the web. Uh, before we begin actually with the panel, I'd, I'd like to offer, uh, as others have, applause and accolades to Case and to One Community for the great work that it's done, beginning in terms of aggregating the dark fiber and going into wireless. We know that even as there are small steps to go forward with the wireless experiment, someplace, somewhere as part of the One Community group, there's somebody that's also working about wireless current so we can get rid of all the attachments that we have to do so we're no longer, while we're not tethered to the net any longer, we no longer have to be tethered to the wall for power. That was supposed to be a joke. I guess it didn't work. <laughs> all right, so our, our title today is actually to make sense of the explosion of Web 2.0 tools and their relevance and consequence for higher education. Uh, how many of you think you know what Web 2.0 is? Great, we're all befuddled, which is just fine. I'm gonna begin actually with a very brief introduction of our panel members. Our intent today is really to have a conversation. Our model or methodology is the African uh, proverb about the blind folks touching different parts of the elephant, so that hopefully by the end of the conversation we have a better sense of, of not only the individual parts, but the aggregation in terms of what the sum looks like. We'll have some panel conversation and also open some of this up to the audience as well. So as we begin, let me first introduce our panel members. You'll see some of them live in both this life and other life. Ed Lee Lamoureux is an associate professor in the Department of Communication at Bradley University. He does a lot of work in the area of multimedia. His research interests include ethnography, ethnography rhetoric, religious communication, uh, teaching and learning in virtual worlds, and you can see his second life avatar up on the screen. He is Professor Bilibu, am I pronouncing that correctly? Uh, and he performs voice and guitar as the professor. Uh, let me also comment, I see that there are a number of notebooks open, screens flashing, blue reflection. For those of you who are faculty members, I just want to point out that you are doing to us what your students do to you, and that's okay with the panel members, all right? <laughs> Even if it was not okay for you as a faculty member. Doug McDavid also lives in, oops, wrong one, I'm sorry. Well, we're going to, Susan Mitros, let me jump ahead. Susan, uh, I should add, I mean, the avatar sort of jumps out at you, said as we were sort of getting mic'd, she is hot in Second Life. Um, that was her assessment, I'm just repeating. Uh, in addition to being hot in Second Life, her first life obligations include being Associate Vice Provost for Technology and Enhanced Learning and Deputy CIO at the University of Southern California. Prior to that, she was at the University, uh, the, the Ohio State University uh, in areas south, and she is actually leads academic technology in integrating new and emerging educational technologies into teaching, learning, research, and outreach. She also has a, uh, an appointment in the Roski School of Art at USC, and she sits on the board of the New Media Consortium and the Board of Advisors of the Educause Learning Initiative. All these folks are very distinguished. Let's see if I can get this right. Who's next? Doug McDavid is uh, the executive consultant in IBM's Global Business Services and Almaden Research Lab. He specializes in bridging the gap between business people and technologists, some of whom may even work on college campuses, and is exploring methods of rehearsing services, techniques, and 3D virtual environments. Doug has six patents, lots of publications in the IBM Systems Journal, the Handbook of Object Technology, and others. He's a member of IBM's prestigious Academy of Technology and also serves on the board of directors of the New Medium Consortium. Last but not least is Michael Scharf. Pardon? I have no avatar. Well, <laughs> Michael has no avatar, but I, my guess, given that this is an entrepreneurial group, somebody's going to set up a booth to do Avatars or Us by, by noon today, if you don't have an avatar. Michael Scharf is from Case, in the School of Law, uh, at, at the Frederick Cox International Law Center here at Case. Professor Scharf served as a member of the elite international team of experts that provided training, the training to the judges and prosecutors of the Iraqi Special Tribunal. And in 2006, he led the first training session for prosecutors and judges for the newly established UN Cambodia Genocide Tribunal. He has been nominated for a Nobel Prize and has been using some of these tools and technologies as part of his teaching as well as his professional work. So, very quick introductions. Our goal here really is, as I said earlier, to have a grounded conversation about Learning 2.0 and the potential of the emerging tools. Let me provide a little bit of context, see if this technology works. Uh, I think it's fair to say that for many of us, depending on uh, the, the color or the, 
the texture, you know, eight, you know, gray or thinning here. We are now in the third decade of the so-called technology revolution, the much typed technology revolution in higher education. Each decade since the arrival of the personal computer has been marked by a defining technology. In the 1980s, it was about essentially hardware and, and software on the desktop, the personal computer. The 1990s, it was about the internet and the web, what Tom Friedman has called the Netscape revolution in the world is flat. And for this decade, it's probably this amorphous cloud of web 2.0 technologies broadly defined. Uh, in each case, we've seen a pattern that these technologies have begun as being cute, often dismissed for being cute to becoming very convenient, to being compelling. Uh, if you happen to see a VisiCalc spreadsheet in late, 19, in late 1970s or early 1980s, and you thought, well, that's cute, but I'll never use that. Any of us who do budgets today, let alone a variety of other things, VisiCalc and, and its successors uh, in terms of Lotus and now Excel or other kinds of tools, these have not only are cute and compel, uh, convenient, but they have, without question, they are compelling. And they also have gone from compelling to compulsory. Perhaps the best example of that is the whole issue of buying an airline ticket. What used to be routine, pick up the phone and call an agent, is now premium service. You pay extra for that, and often you get less information as opposed to scouring the web in terms of prices and options and everything else. And with that, we find at the same time, for those of us in the education community, we have to temper our great aspirations about the opportunities and the roles of these technologies to coming to a realistic assessment about what difference do they make? What difference do they make? We're gonna hold the what difference do they make conversation till later this afternoon. Today we wanna to talk about the aspirations and the opportunities in this first conversation. So with that, Let's see if this works. There are a lot of these technologies. They're populating the screen as we talk. And Susan, as these technologies are the logos for a lot of these Web 2.0s populate, I'd like to begin our conversation with you. you know, it was almost three decades ago that, in fact, business schools became the first point in the campus curricula that really began to talk about teams and collaboration. And they talked about it as a process of the curricula, particularly in MBA programs. It trickled down to the undergraduate programs. It migrated into engineering. But again, that was largely a conversation about process, not about the enabling tools that made that process possible. Given that we're on a topic about collaboration technologies today, I'm gonna to ask you to, in one sense, give us that broad overview about where we are with some of these technologies, the opportunities for collaboration. Your role as an evangelist for this is as, as the deputy CIO at USC and your conversations with faculty who are across the spectrum in terms of their levels of use and comfort with these technologies. Well, I think the first mistake we make is we assume that they're tools. And I've heard the use tool or product used quite a bit just in the first hour of this presentation. And you have to realize that Web 2.0 is a platform, it's a service, it's not a tool. The tool might be the outcome. And if I go to my faculty and say, do you want an iPod? They say, great, but what does that iPod do for them? Am I really giving them a tool or am I saying, do you want mobility? Do you want convenience? Do you want accessibility? And I find if I ask that question, then I have many more ways of providing uh, services to that particular faculty member, because it might not be an, I, you know, an iPod, or it might not be a desktop. It might be something totally different. It might be their cell phone. So that's one way I think we're really thinking differently about how we talk to our faculty about these types of, of activities and services and you know I guess what I would like to think is that we think of these as services. In the so. context of services and the kind of mm -hmm. fear and trembling that many faculty mm -hmm. experience for their students whether they're 18 to 68 who live in a consumer economy and have lots of experience both, in, both in, as consumers but also using these services that are offered by corporations mm -hmm. servicing the consumer economy. We're just thinking about some of the logos that we see on the screen. Facebook, YouTube, mm -hmm. Flickr, Blogger, other kinds of things. Take us into that domain for some of these particular platforms, particularly for, for faculty. Is this a matter of, of the fear, trembling, and uncertainty? How, you know, what are some of the opportunities to, to tap the potential of these, uh, these resources? Well, I think we've turned a corner. I, I, I think if you asked um, a group of faculty, in fact, we did this at a conference two days ago, how many of you know about Facebook? And well, how many of you know about Facebook? Let's, let's ask, how many of you know about Facebook? How many okay. of you have profiles on Facebook? How many of you expect to add 10 new friends by the end of this conference? <laughs> Nobody's committing to that one, okay. And how many of you are 18 years old? Right. How many of you have posted on YouTube? How many of you want to tell us what about you has been posted on YouTube? <laughs> All right, how many of you blog? Okay. Uh, how many of you Twitter? How many of you would like to know what Twitter is? 
It's, yes. <laughs> it's okay, we're all under non-disclosure here. Right. Okay. Uh -huh. What happens in Cleveland stays in Cleveland, right? Except for the network that goes all <laughs> over the world <laughs> and, and Second Life. So uh, you know, one of the issues is how do you bring, again, these opportunities, these yeah. processes, these goals to faculty and say, how are you going to use them? And I'm finding, particularly because I teach in the fine arts, I teach in visual communication, uh, things like Flickr, the idea that you can bring your own collections forward is a tremendous asset for faculty. Flickr's uh, being photo collections. Photo collections, okay. yes, slide collections from years and years mm -hmm. and years ago. Uh, the ability for students to be able to interact with each other through whether we're using Google Apps or Facebook. I mean, Facebook, if you haven't looked in a while, is becoming a really powerful application. Students can set up their own courses and they can invite the faculty to be part of that course. And if the faculty wants to become a part of the course, the faculty then gets some additional functionality. But students are building their study groups. Their, well, one, one university you know, apparently sanctioned a student for building a, a collaborative study group. Yeah. It, it, uh, and this thing was all over the web, it was all through the Facebook mm -hmm. community in one sense, of building what is fairly common in law schools, this kind of collaborative work, and in one sense, the claim was sharing answers. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you'll see, we had a, uh, and our, our library wanted to do a survey, and they got very little response, mm -hmm. and they had one of the students set up as an event in Facebook and got 600 responses. So I think the faculty are starting to see the interest in this, and as I said, we just had a conference, and there's a tremendous amount of interest, but there's still that gap about, here's the tool, Here's what I want to do. How do I make that meaningful in my class? And I think it's you almost it's a one-to-one -one type of service. You have to go to a faculty member and say, let me see your syllabus, your syllabus mm -hmm. and let's see where it's appropriate to add these different types of activities or services that in the end might end up on a device or as, as a tool. Right. And Michael, I saw you were nodding and Susan actually has given us a great handoff that was unscripted, right? Mm -hmm. In the sense of some of these tools, because you've been using some of these tools so uh, in, in your legal training and also some of the other you've been right. doing. Take us into that domain in terms of what what difference some of these tools make and how you've been using some of these tools. Let me start off by saying that unlike I think most of the people in this room who are very tech savvy, I probably represent most of the rest of the university and, and those. I, I'm a bit of a technological Luddite. Okay. Um, and three years ago or four years ago, uh, two people came into my life that transformed it. Um, one I think is here, Carl Roloff, who's our IT um, and webmaster at the school, and the other is a student, Brianne Draffen, who had um, a lot of web experience. She came to me um, during the new student's orientation and said, you know, I, I do international law, but I'm also a web guru. Do you have any needs for me? And my eyes lit up because I had all these ideas and I had no idea where to start. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the, very quickly, we put together a blog, um, we put together a e-newsletter, and we put together a portal um, and we also have a lot of electronic archives. Now, just to tell you a little bit about the blog and how we use it as an educational tool, we start out by getting experts to blog on war crimes trial developments. And we just got sort of the people that I appear at conferences on to agree to do frequent blogs. And there are 20 of us that do that. We've done 600 essays. Then we start getting our students. And these are short essays yeah, or long? Short. Yeah page long max. Okay. Uh, and then we had our students as part of their requirement for international law mm -hmm. and international criminal law and war crimes law and other courses have to do blog essays in response to either the news developments or what the experts were saying. And we've now had 600 of those. Um, this blog has become so popular, the media uses it. Just yesterday, the Christian Science Monitor called me up and they said they saw a blog posting that I had done recently in a connection to one of my articles, and they are doing an article about the new crime of forced marriage mm -hmm. in Sierra Leone. And because they had seen me on this blog, they wanted to interview me, and then tomorrow it'll be in the newspaper. So there's a relationship between you know the news who are following these blogs, the students who are doing it, um, we've won now several web awards. Uh, 200,000 people have visited the blog, um, which isn't a huge number for a regular blog, but for a, a very academic-oriented blog, it is. And the people who visit it in, include all the experts in the field, and they're following it very closely. So what we've been able to do is create a mechanism mm -hmm. where the students are contributing, experts are contributing, the media is contributing, the people of these tribunals out there are interested, and then finally, um, they started to post their stuff, like the Iraqis didn't have a good website of their own, so they gave us their judgment in English, and we're the only place that it's available, and then the Iraqi judges 
um, came to the United States for their first appearance outside of Iraq, they picked us to come to because of this relationship that grew out of the blog. So just one little blog can do all of that. I want to come back to something you said early on, though. It, it, it was that a student came to you and said, I've got these skills and I can help you. I mean, it's a, this is a different kind of collaboration, but in one sense, it's the most traditional of academic collaborations, isn't it? In the sense of the, the kind of mentoring that we've often seen where students have some skills, faculty members have, a, have, have wisdom, see an opportunity, trying to make that, that gestalt between the skill, or as Susan says, the platform for that larger part. And she made it a, safe for yeah, you in one sense. I think sense. a lot of this, for, for us that are tech virgins, uh -huh. <laughs> we're just scared to right. jump into this stuff and we need someone to hold our hand and guide us through it. And it turns out that it's, it's much easier than it looks from the mm -hmm. outside. But to have a student or to have someone like the ID department, um, Carl Roloff, you know, be that guide is just really invaluable for the faculty members. Well, if, if Michael was, was scared in civilian life, Ed, a lot of us are even more uncertain about what wanders in the territory of second life. <laughs> so why don't you take us there a little bit? Because you've been, you've been doing that. You know, we, we saw your avatar. Let's bring that back. Uh, tell us about you know, essentially the whole issue of, of how we go into from this life to second life and some of the options and opportunities there. I'm an evangelist uh -huh. and I'm also a, uh, a critic both ways. Um, I'm able to use Second Life to teach undergraduate students how to do ethnography, field mm -hmm. research. Um, it's a topic and a set of methods that undergraduate students don't often contact, especially in the discipline I'm in, which is multimedia, uh, mostly production students. So I'm able to use the world to teach in, for the students to do research in, and it is for students living in Peoria, Illinois, where I teach at Bradley mm -hmm. University, um, probably for many of them the most diverse, most global place they'll ever be. For me as a teacher taking new researchers into an environment, it's a safer place for them to be as researchers, it's a safer place for the subjects, mm -hmm. there's less potential risk in terms of damage to the subjects, and yet it's this interesting diverse environment to do, uh, to do the work in. So. On, on, the, on the teaching side, I can do something with Second Life that I really can't do face to face. Just a, a real small example, in an evening I might send students out to do research for an hour. I can supervise seven or eight students in their field location, not simultaneously, but in that hour. If I had to hop in my car and drive around town and try to find these people if they were in the field, I wouldn't be able to do it. So it's a, it's a unique teaching environment in that fashion. Um, but I also on yeah. the, go ahead. Just, but some we've heard we, we've heard and we've experienced a lot of these same statements about what happened with the arrival of the internet. Right. It brought incredibly rich content to locations, whether it was in Peoria, Upper Peninsula of Michigan, any place, to places that didn't have that content that weren't Harvard Library, New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago. What's the added? You know, so what becomes this added value of Second Life? This added metric, this added re richness that you. The, in terms of research, in terms of interaction? I think the, the most important thing about a virtual world, the, the, folks are in them for different reasons. Uh -huh. You asked me. I think the most important thing is human interaction. Mm -hmm. Has nothing to do for me with really the platform or what it can do other than how it facilitates human interaction. And, and that's sort of, we're gonna talk about the corporate world in right. just a second. And, and the thing that's remarkable is, you know, I'm teaching ethnography both with regard to how you would do it in life, in real life, mm -hmm. but also uh, online research. And they're sort of together in my course. Um, this is an environment where students have to keep track of subjects who can be talking uh, in public, talking privately to one person, talking to a group, so there's a three by, either in text or in a vo voice. Mm -hmm. And so it's a multi-channel environment for communication. I, you know, people are there for lots of different reasons, but most of the people that I meet in the world are there for social relationships and social interaction, and we try to leverage that for learning simulations and other kind of training. Um, but really the thing that's unique about it is this kind of multiplicity of uh, communication channels that maps with the rest of the 2.0 environment that we're living in, and especially the corporate environment. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, if you watch the guys out in the halls and watch each other as you were here today, you know, no one's, no one's disconnected. Mm -hmm. and, and, and most of you are doing two or three different things in addition to listening to us. And, and Doug turned off four, I'm sorry, just to, just to come up and, and sit with <laughs> us. So, 
that's a that, that's a but nice his avatar map. is out there doing all the well, other stuff, I, right? Yeah. yeah, and we we just actually. Yeah. I, I was sitting at the table with the last one. I had uh, had uh, that on in Second Life. I had the web version on. We were listening, and and I thought maybe I would just fall into the black hole. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, uh, let, let's shift then, because you again unrehearsed segue to Doug. Most you know three out of the four of the panelists, Doug, academics, yeah. kind of looking out from campus. You did deal in a very different world in terms of both IBM as a as a firm that uses these technologies and IBM as a firm that services clients that right. use these technologies. Help us understand yeah. kind of the, uh, you know, we're going to put on you the corporate burden. Help us understand the power and potential of these technologies from that perspective in both the corporate environment and the consumer environment. Okay, and how many it, hours do I have? You, you have about uh, <laughs> 45 seconds left. Yeah. Well, actually I'd like to start with a plug um, and mention that you all have this document in your uh, packet and I point that out because the things that I talk about are represented here primarily, I would say, in the, uh, the three to five year look ahead of a social operating system, which goes along with Ed's point about this really as a social kind mm -hmm. of technology, um, and then the collaboration webs, which are, you know, called out here as being a right now, you know, sort of happening technology. Um, so I'll quickly hit a few points, and then maybe it'll come back around and I okay. can give you some um, personal experiences, but um, I also want to key off the discussion between you and Susan at the beginning about collaboration in learning. And one of the points I really want to make is that, you know, I f find that really um, counterproductive to cut off collaboration in learning because in the corporate world, what we're seeing in the world at large is collaboration really is where things are going. Right. IBM is like 350 to 400,000 employees around the world. We have something like 50,000 IBMers in India. We're con continuously doing projects that involve people in you know, countries all over the world and collaborating remotely and collaborating with clients. Um, so you know, it's really important for, I think, the education experience to be preparing people coming into the mm -hmm. world that, you know, it's not all about you, it's not what grades you got, it's really how can you work with other people. Um, and do these technologies really enable that in a way that goes beyond the efforts and some of the curricular stuff that college has been trying to do for more than 20 years? So in, in terms of, you know, the one technology that we're talking about here in the virtual worlds, it's hard for me to even talk about this without sort of getting the personal aspect, but um, it is such a breakthrough in being able to do things in a collaborative and social way um, that, I mean, I think we're just scratching the surface of how can we really put that to use. But other kinds of technologies, you mentioned Facebook, um, the ability to sort of project yourself and project your personality and your knowledge and your experiences into a larger space um, is, you know, just invaluable. So, you know, I think that's really the way things are going. Um, and, you know, not just a little bit of, of language which other people can respond to, but, you know, how do we interact and, and do things in a, in a real-time collaborative but way. Is, but is, is, is the notion of collaboration something that we have to teach or is it something that the, these technologies enable and foster in and of themselves? I mean, again, thinking about the IBM experience, the expectations of your clients that IBM serves in this environment. I think it's that we need to enable people to do it, to experience it, to expect it, uh, because it actually is a natural human behavior. The thing is that we're now trying to do that natural human behavior, you know, across the globe. Ed, you know, on a real-time basis. Take that same question, because you, you work in this world. Is it a matter, does the experience make it so, in terms of fostering an understanding of collaboration? I mean, again, we don't necessarily, you know, team sports and whatever as we're younger, for both young, young boys and young girls, but this is a different level of teamwork and collaboration. Is it a matter that we have to kind of teach these environments to undergraduates and graduate students, or does the technology just sort of foster it on its own? I think it depends on, uh, first of all, we're dealing with a big, that, that's a pretty wide demographic. <laughs> I mean, that's 16 to 28, and that's, you know, that, that's even assuming. So there's a lot of folks in there who come at collaboration and using these kinds of technology. Sure. 
but, but you, but you kind of get me to think about something that, that I think is important. You know, the technologies, tools, we can call them whenever we want. I don't like actually any of those terms. It's a medium. Mm -hmm. And a medium is the combination of the tools and technologies and the use to which those are put culturally influenced. Mm -hmm. Our students come with interesting cultural influences about these environments. Yeah. So let's talk Second Life for just a second because some of us are in there and we, we, we get a lot of effective things done. I've got students from 17 to 22 who think Second Life is just boring as hell. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, it's not a video game. There's no shooting, there's no levels, there's no uh, gold medallions, and there's no orcs to kill. Right. They want to come in here, sit around and chat with each other? Hmm. No, I'd rather go to a bar and do that. They want to come in here and have virtual sex, which the press writes about as a big deal? Well, no, actually, I'd kind of like to meet Jane. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they come at it at different levels. By the time they're a graduate student, they're thinking about how do you teach people, how do you train people, how do we get people involved in education in a different way. Then they think about it all together differently. Here's a new collaborative tool for teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm not saying all undergraduates are that way, but I, I, I think I, what I want to be a little bit careful about is, 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 is not forgetting that students come to these mediums mm -hmm. with expectations for them. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of speaks to your question about collaboration. It depends where they are in their track in terms of having already worked. Now, if they haven't worked collaboratively, it's a wonderful place to give them yeah. some exposure to Michael, doing you deal you know, with an audience, Doug and Ed talked about culture. You deal with an audience that comes from an entirely different culture in one sense as a participant and consumer with some of the materials mm -hmm. that you and your students are producing on this blog. Take us into that world, which is a text-based world for the most part, but still transcends other kinds of cultures as we think about either university cultures or an American culture. Well, and, and just also to tie this in with collaboration and, and some of the challenges that we face when we're doing these things. The biggest challenge I have is um, costs. If I want uh, the students to help me out with something, I can try to get that out of my very small faculty budget, or I can try to figure out a, a way to reward them. And what we ended up doing, for example, was we created an electronic newsletter that goes out to 17,000 people, including all the staff of these international tribunals, that talks about all the developments that are going on in the world of war crimes. Mm -hmm. And the students organize themselves as a mini law review. Um, for those of you who don't live in the world of law schools, it's a publication where the students run it, and it has at the top an editor-in-chief and a senior staff and then junior staff. And we didn't have to pay them anything. They just want it on their resume. And we have 35 students churning out every two weeks these electronic newsletters that go through cyberspace and it brings all sorts of attention to the university and it educates people around the world and it educates the students because they're working and learning about these different developments. Um, and so that's you know one of these collaborative ways. It's, it's not inside of cyberspace, but it's related to cyberspace. But let's yeah. go to the consumers of those blogs, though, in one yeah. sense. I mean, you've, you've talked about changing the culture among your students in one sense. Let's talk about how that has been a catalyst for changing the culture oh, among yes. the, the users. Well, for example, our um, Grosjean Moment blog, the War Crimes blog, is the first ever academic blog of essays that turned into a book, an academic book. And um, it's been published and widely read, and it's now being used as a book um, by book. a print book. Not a cyber book. Um, right, exactly, okay. a physical book uh, by an academic publisher um, all over the country and, and over the world. And the teacher's guide to the book shows the people how to use the book and the blog simultaneously. So that's one way. Um, I already mentioned that the media follows the blog. And f sometimes I see quotes of myself. And I say, I never even talked to that person you know, in an interview. And I think what media now believe is that it's appropriate journalism to quote an essay from a blog as if they interviewed somebody and not to say this appeared on a blog, but just to make the world think that was an interview. So that's a new phenomenon I'm starting to see a lot of. Um, the tribunals themselves are, you know, their, their cases are citing to these essays and to the things that we're posting on the blog. And so you see major war crimes trial cases now citing, and, and also uh, academic publications. Uh, two, three years ago, if you cited to blogs and academic publications, people would frown on that. They would say that's not scholarly enough. Now the blue book, which is in legal terms the special book that tells you how to do citations, tells you how to do those because everybody is now seeing that as the cutting edge way of citing to things. Now we're not citing to Wikipedia, but to something like the Groshen Moment blog, we're seeing a lot of Which has a peer review things. culture in this environment. Yeah, which, is, well, which is different yes, than Wikipedia. Exactly, in exactly. Right. And, and ultimately yeah. I'm responsible for the mm -hmm. content of it. And so my own 
uh, prestige or, or whatever is on the line. Yeah. Um, and with Wikipedia, people just don't know who's responsible. It's not really an accountability. Susan, we, we've, we've talked about students, we've talked about faculty. So I want to come back to the student side of this. Right? You know, a lot of faculty believe that, of course, all their students are wired, although just because they can game in Google doesn't mean that's the case. But we're seeing some very interesting phenomena in terms of some of these technologies. And, and let's talk about Facebook for a moment as, as a, an example of this. Uh, if I were an epidemiologist on a college campus in a community, a thousand students, a thousand people were aff afflicted, if you will, by something. If I were the CIO of a college or university or in a school and a thousand computers had, a, had something in it, I would immediately take notice. And yet we're hearing stories. One comes out of Stanford, it's coming out of some other institutions as well, that almost 100% of the entering class, freshman classes or graduate school classes or MBA programs or law, students are creating these affinity groups almost the day after they get the thick envelopes that say you're in. Before they come. Before, well, they, yeah, I'm an applicant and then mm -hmm. I migrate to, you know, I'm now part of the thick envelope group at Acme University. Mm -hmm. These are out of the control of the college or university in one sense, and yet they are very much live in a parallel, almost a kind of another kind of second life with the university mm -hmm. campus and culture. What, what does that do in terms of sort of upsetting some of the, the culture environments that we're talking about? Well, I had an interesting thought uh, at, a couple days ago at this conference when we were talking to some of the faculty, and I realized that five years ago, faculty were worried that distance education was going to replace their jobs. And on Tuesday, I talked to many faculty who were worried that their students were going to replace their jobs. Mm -hmm. And part of that reason is, is the students have the techno technological skills, and the students now want to become producers of their education. They can make YouTubes. They can you know, do all this work. They are on Facebook. They're bringing groups together. Now, what I believe is that the students are visually and media stimulated but they're not literate and they're far from fluent and there's some really big differences in those definitions. Uh, we teach literacy for, t you know, for reading and writing, yet the, the majority of our students today are visual learners. As you can look around anywhere, the majority of information that we bring in is visual, yet we don't pe teach people how to see. We don't teach them how to encode and decode images. We don't teach them about the ethical implications and the validity of images. And so I think that's an important Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the exact response you had, but I think it gives you a little bit of background. Ed, you're nodding. Mm -hmm. As we use a medium, the medium uses us. Mm -hmm. And part of what we uh, probably are not teaching students enough about is the, are the various ways that Web 2.0 uses us. Mm -hmm. So, very simple example. Uh, I own all of my own lecture notes. Always have, every university I've been at has given me copyright. In Second Life, I retain the copyrights. Linden Lab has been gracious enough to grant us back our copyright. But there is a, another codicil in the terms of service that says, but we own everything. I have copyright, but they own everything. So I, the way I distribute my notes in, in, in Second Life is I make a note card and I give it to all of the students. All of my content is now proprietary. I have the copyright, but it's owned by someone else. Now, we're not going to go to court over that. They're nice guys until they sell. <laughs> <laughs> So your and IP becomes part of their IPO in one Phil, sense. Phil's a heck of a nice guy, and yeah. he likes it the way it is, but the day he sells, I don't know about the next, the next person. Yeah, but I mean, it's, so, interesting, it's interesting in one sense that your intellectual property becomes potentially part of their initial public offering in terms of adding value. When, in a user-created environment, yes. and, and, and a lot of Web 2.0, that, that's part of what you're getting at, a lot of Web 2.0. Mr. Williams is going to talk about it this afternoon, yeah. Cal Cotton Williams in the book. I mean, it's, it's a prosumer environment yeah. where we produce little bits of economic value that the environment takes out. We got to think about that side, too. Yeah. It facilitates our work, but on the other hand, there are some downsides. Michael, but also, it, perhaps in a way that Susan didn't have, Intent, the, the, the statement about visual learning and visual experience in the context of war crimes has to have very significant impacts. You know, and yet, you're t you know, the medium of blogging is largely a text based one, but you're talking about text based one where there's lots of, if you will, visual, ev well, visuals right, right. that may or may not be actual visual evidence. And, well, and sometimes, like the trial of Saddam Hussein, they have a, a before and after photo of the town he demolished which was the crucial smoking gun piece of evidence that's up there on our blog for everybody to see. Um, probably you all have heard in, in NPR the story about how what's going on in Darfur, there is now a satellite that is focusing on the destruction of villages and anybody can click on and see genocide occurring in real time as a way of getting the world very worked up about this and yet we still haven't done enough about it but we can watch it on TV or not even TV but through the computer. Yeah. Doug, let's take this back to the consumer economy and the corporate environment. This is exploding in one sense. You know, we're, we're hearing about 
uh, automobile manufacturers mm -hmm. are doing test drives in Second Life, people that are doing product testing. Ed talked about doing research. You know, where, where did, who's leading and who's lagging on this? I mean, is it a case that we've seen in, in so many other instances that universities are in one sense in the wake of so much that's going on off campus in looking at and evaluating these technologies? Individuals may be at the forefront, but institutions in aggregate are lagging. Well, I would say just you don't have to name my, names. No, I won't. I, well, I won't name names. Um, but I would actually the perception that I have is that uh, higher ed is in the lead, actually. Um, when, and maybe that's the per, from the perspective of, that I have from the NMC side. But you know, the number of islands and the number of events, uh, the conferences that have been run for you know like a whole week, you know, completely in a virtual world. Um, I don't see that much really on the corporate side, you know, that actually really compares, you know, from that are, virtual world Are you seeing a lot of the action of early adapters, or do you think that it's, it's beyond that first wave of early adapters? I think it's still in the early stages. In both campus and corporate? Yeah. Okay. I mean, but, um, one thing I, I did want to sort of make a point on uh, another linkage between the corporate world and the, you know, the higher ed world. Um, since becoming involved with NMC, I've started to realize how much IBM in particular, but other corporations actually are institutions of higher education. Um, our budget is probably close to a billion dollars for learning in IBM. That makes us kind of a mid-sized university equivalent, and that is only really what's sort of budgeted on that. So again, the, the collaboration um, between academic institutions and uh, and you know, sort of the business world. Um, any place that we have this co uh, this technology, that collaboration can really be enhanced. And uh, one of the specific examples that I have is the project that actually brought me into Second Life in the first place was something that we call rehearsal services, where the idea is that almost anything that you could do, and in particular in the services economy could really benefit by in sort of co-learning and re rehearsing training in, simulation right mm -hmm. and and um, supported and enabled with you know the best form of collaborative technology that you can get now again that's very early adopter type work but you know this is a beginning right. I want to give the audience a chance to have that the four of you uh, for a few moments so at this point we're going to open it up. Uh, questions, comments, rejoinders to our four panel members at this point. And we're asking in, in real life at this point, folks. Your, your avatar cannot pose the question for the first round. Over here, please identify who you are and your institutional or organizational affiliation. Phil Long from MIT. Okay. And this is a question to the group, but primarily to Susan. Um, and that is, you mentioned that we need to rethink what, what it means to be literate in the 21st century. And I'm just curious to hear some ideas of what the dimensions of that literacy might need to be for someone who is consider considered to be educated as a citizen in this, this, this decade. Well, the nice thing about t bringing this round, a lot of what being literate is exactly the patterns of design for Web 2, the Web 2.0 platform. I mean, it's not looking at the big companies, it's looking at the long tail. It's looking at data as being valuable and sharing data, but owning your data. And that's something that universities, as you said, we own our data and we're taking very, very little advantage of sharing um, or sharing it in a, in a non-proprietary way. In fact, I think what you do at MIT with the Open Knowledge Initiative is brilliant because if, if you're familiar with uh, MIT's project, they share, they have all their courses online and you can take them, you have discussion groups. I'm sure, Phil, you're going to talk about this later. But the beauty of this is they've, they've changed the mark. What the, what the currency is is not the, the content. The currency is the degree. You can take every single class at MIT virtually, but you've got to go there to get the degree, and you've got to pay for the degree, and that's the credibility, and that's what counts. So I think it's things like that. I also think just to you know, basis in terms of students every day, um, you know, I do a lot of design classes, and my students can do really nice MTV iMovies or quick cuts. They can do really what some people call authentic YouTubes. I like to call them amateur, but they don't understand the whole idea of narrative and storytelling. 
So there is a whole, whole vocabulary of vision and vocabulary of media of how you build a story, how you make a story, how you interview somebody, all these things that we're not teaching our students. And we don't often give them the places for them to learn. How many of you have a place on your campus where students can practice giving a presentation that's videotaped? How many have a user usability lab that students can use to test, do focus groups, to test what they're doing? And to me, this is so much more important than them going out and saying, I've learned how to build, to write a 10-page double-space paper that's in one great. Sense they have to do both. Yes, they do have to do both, but okay. we've ignored the other side of it. Ed, you look like you want to jump in on that. Yeah. Just to get, fill my answer. I, it's it's a great question. It took us two thousand years to figure out, I think, how writing works. I think it took us at least a hundred years to figure out how photography works. I think we haven't figured out about television yet. Um, in, in in my teaching, I'm I'm trying to get students to be critical about how this stuff works, and I think it's very difficult. I think, I think if you look at our enterprises, we spend a tremendous amount of time teaching students how to use the tools. I think we t spend a tremendous amount of time encouraging them to use the tools. I think we spend an infinitesimal amount of time teaching them to be critical about what using the tools means. Mm -hmm. And I think that's our fault, and I think we're gonna have to do a better job. Michael. And, and in the world of, of law teaching, we, we are really illiterate when it comes to the technology. And just my exposure to what you all have said today, I've jotted down 10 new ideas of things that I want to take back to, to the law school. Things from why not use you know, this virtual world to practice interviewing rather than do it live. Um, I run a non-governmental organization that does peace negotiations and we do simulations with our clients before they go into the regular one. Why not do it virtually? And I hadn't ever thought about this. So there's a, a whole new world of literacy that I need to jump into just from this. I hope everybody else that, that isn't so literate that's here today will have a similar experience. We have, Harvard Law School actually has a courtroom, if I'm correct, mm -hmm. in Second Life. So that's something Other question? Mm -hmm. Len, yeah. we need, uh, if you get a microphone or, or, or just stand and scream. I can scream. Okay. Uh, I'm Len Steinbeck, and I'm, I consult with a number of cultural institutions. And I'm really interested in what you see as new models of how innovation is diffused. Um, you used to have some sort of linear models of the uh, diffusion of innovation, but it seems that those are all breaking down, and I think helping to understand how this um, diffuse, diffusion takes place would be helpful. And also there's that thing called change management, which I don't really mean change control, but I don't know that institutions are really engaged in managing the change around us and, and making it acceptable. And I was wondering what's happening in that world to accommodate these new media. And I'm gonna walk down the panel because each one of you have a different piece of the elephant on that one. So Susan, yours is the largest at an institutional level. Diffusion and change management in 30 seconds or less. Well, I think it's a new game. I think you really have to think differently. Uh, it's not about a new uh, software update coming out. It's about perpetual change. Uh, my biggest fight is how I operationalize it. You know, we get great ideas, we've got YouTube. How do I get my operation staff who has a million things, they're running Blackboard, they're running this, they're running that, you know, security to suddenly say, oh, guess what, now you're running blogging software. So that's, that's the difficult thing for me. And I think it's making a really good case and getting your stakeholders, who's going to use it, you know, like, much like the web. Get the people behind it, and it's hard to turn it down. Michael, diffusion, change management, and legal education? You know, Case Western as a university has this thing called U-Sight, which is a weekly or two, every two-week meeting where the faculty get together and share pedagogical ideas. And it seems to me we need to start doing something like that in the virtual world. Um, and, and either have half the youth site sessions devoted to that or have a whole nother one. And each of the schools, um, you know, law, medicine, they all need to make this a priority because the professors are gonna be very reluctantly pulled into this. And unless they know that there's a positive incentive, they won't jump into this world. And until they do, their students aren't gonna get the marvelous benefits that we've been talking about. So Doug, everything off campus? <laughs> Change management, diffusion? Well, yeah, let me even give sort of an on-off-campus example. Yeah. Um, one of the things to say about this is the social systems and the technological systems are co-evolving, right? And in some cases, what we're trying to do in the world is ahead of what we're actually really supporting well with the technology. But, you know, I'll point to Hank Chesbrough's book on open innovation, the research interpenetration with co companies and ac academic institutions 
one of the big programs at IBM is something called Services Sciences Management and Engineering. And you can go look up SSME on the web and learn more about that. But this is very open, um, partnering, collaborative innovation, um, which probably could be better supported by the tools that we have, but, but uh, the social phenomenon is in some ways driving the use of the tools. Ed? Um, there's a book called the, the New Communicators, I think it's called, Roger Fiedler updates uh, Ev Rogers' diffusion theory, and it works. It's not perfect, but it works. All right, I, I'm obligated to bring this panel to a close. I want to give you each an opportunity for a last comment. Yep, I'm sorry. Oh, my apologies. Please, let's go to Second Life. Hi, um, oh, sorry. Um, uh, the avatar, Robin Mochi, asks the professor this question, how long has your university been in Second Life, and are the number of students and others from your university who are using SL growing or declining, and what do you attribute that to? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that's you. Yeah, we've been in, uh, Bradley University's been in now about a year and a half. I've been teaching two years. Um, the university as a whole is growing and, 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 and more faculty across a broad range of disciplines are doing better. Um, I'm not doing as well. <laughs> and so I'm going to go back and sort of repackage what I'm doing and see why students aren't as interested as I thought they would be. And so it's a dynamic. But um, I, I think universities are finding that like in the rollout of any other new technology, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sharp curve. Um, it takes a lot of help from folks like the people that Susan runs and the people that Lev runs. And it's, uh, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's not easy, but in some disciplines, it's very worthwhile, and it's really the only way you can do certain things. And that's, I think, what's, what's really important is that we get to the stuff that we can really do well with a given medium. Okay, great. Let me, again, chance for each to make a final comment either to return to something you said, has there been a sin of omission, something that we didn't ask that we should come back to, what don't we know to ask about these issues as we look forward to where we go with these platforms, tools, technologies, resources, whatever terms we'd like to use. Uh, Doug, I'm going to begin with you. Okay. Um, yeah, just really quickly, I think it all sort of summarizes that barriers are really breaking down um, geographically, of course, but between learning and work as well, and that these technologies really support the continuation of that, which is a trend which is, you know, just unstoppable. Ed, a last word? Something to go back to? Something we, we haven't touched on that we need to emphasize? Yeah, in some ways the information revolution is about um, collecting information about us. So in these environments we have to look at both sides of that equation. Um, we collect a lot of information in Web.2.0, a lot of information, and it's, it advantages everyone. And while we're doing that, digital leaves tracks. There's information being collected about us. And we need to know about the other side as well. Privacy issues in one sense. Not just privacy. Privacy, but more. also added yeah, value of the data. The, the prosumer mm -hmm. gets a lot of value out of the environment, but in little increments. In fact, I think I'm going to pay your bill in Linden's. Two, <laughs> 265 Will to the Will you pay dollar. my son's college tuition two, in Linden's? Two, 265 right. to the dollar. Yeah. Uh, but yet. I've given them a tremendous amount of information sure. about me and my life and my class, and so we've got to look but, at both sides of that. But you've also done that at Amazon. You've also Absolutely. done that at any website. That's that's 2.0. It right. goes in both directions. Yep. Michael. Now clearly, I've got a lot of work to stay on top of this stuff. Um, last yeah, year, but Michael, you're also, from what you told us, you're well ahead of many of your colleagues in the law way, school. Way ahead. Okay. Yeah, and we all have a lot of work. But just as a personal experience, last year. I teach at a summer abroad program that we run in, in the Netherlands, and we set up a room with computers for the students, and it's open all night. And, and I thought they were writing emails to their parents and maybe downloading pictures, and they're all doing their Facebooks, and they showed me their Facebooks. I was like, wow, I didn't really know how that all worked. This summer, they're all going to be doing the second life, and at least I'll be conversant mm -hmm. and know what it is, and I'll, pr I'll have them show me what it's all about. And as you'll well. probably go with an avatar. Because I need an avatar. You need an avatar. <laughs> so, so all the folks who want to volunteer to help Michael with his avatar, or avatars, mm -hmm. as it may be. Susan, the last word is yours. Okay. Well, I feel like I owe the audience, because you originally asked me what, what is 2.0, and we really haven't said what 2.0 is. And so I did what any academic would do. I went to the seminal source, and that was Google, and I... <laughs> 
checked up, put it, looked through some articles, and I've distilled it down to five P's because every academic panel needs, you know, the five initials of something. And my five, five consonants, right? yes, yeah. five consonants. Well, sometimes they're also uh, <laughs> the other. So one, it's, it's platform. It's not a product. Two, it's about principles, and we've talked about a lot of those principles. You know, long tail, data driven. Three, it's about practices, and and the flow around those practices. Four, it's about participation, and that means the people and the fact that it's non-proprietary. And the last one, it's about play, because the beauty of 2.0 is it really allows you to play. Your programmers get to tinker, which they don't usually get to do, and it really allows you to try things in innovative ways to really add to the body of this knowledge of collaboration. Great. All right. Well, for the audience here and the audience at Second Life, I hope that we've had an interesting and engaging and fast-moving conversation. Clearly, we've only touched the surface. My thanks to our four panelists, Ed Lamoureux, Susan Mitros, Doug McDavid and Michael Sheriff for your, your comments and your candor as we've talked today. And thanks, thanks very much. Thanks to Casey. <laughs>